strong mismanagement of the government. Uh, in the sense that when you have, uh, uh, several years ago, when oil reached $147 a barrel, uh, Iran was the only major oil producer in the world whose population claimed that their economic lot had actually gotten worse despite the tripling of oil prices. Which is quite an achievement when you think about it. You know, oil prices triple, almost quadruple, and people say we're worse off than the world. Um, so I think that as the Islamic Republic has progressed over the years, um, uh, increasingly um, the skilled technocrats and pragmatists and managers have been purged from the system and political appointees have been put in a place. And I, I personally find it difficult to see how they're going to be able to sustain uh, the management of this economy uh, over a long term. Now, that being said, I think there's no doubt that this opposition movement, this free movement faces tremendous challenges. Um, I think one of the very first challenges is the fact that there exists a uh, fundamental generational and a worldview gap between the leadership of the opposition and the young foot soldiers in the streets. I think part of the reason why is that uh, the folks who are the nominal leaders of this movement never signed up to be opposition movement leaders, people like Mir Hussein Musavi, Mehdi Kalabi, Mohammed Khatri. They wanted to reform the system from within, and they were you know, thrust into this position uh, unintentional. And I think to their credit, um, they have shown themselves to be uh, tremendously resilient, uh, despite being under enormous duress. Um, but I think that it's a, it's a big challenge when um, these individuals want, say, 30% change or 40% reform of the Islamic Republic, but they're up against a regime that wants to stay in power 200%. And if you go back to the 1979 revolution, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini uh, wanted to upturn the entire, uh, this was you know, the Shah's uh, podium of power, Khomeini wanted to upturn that podium and burn it. And what these guys are trying to do is much more delicate in the sense that they're trying to pull a tablecloth from the table but keep the place settings in place, um, which is far more challenging. And I think when you look at um, the numerous challenges of, of the opposition movement, for, for the last seven, eight months, um, one of the primary strategies has simply been to participate in street protests. And any street protests which are sanctioned by the government, they try to co-opt those street protests. Um, and most recently, they had uh, a turnout which dampened morale. They, they wanted to have uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of people take to the streets, recreate the the largest demonstration which took place last June, June 15th, in which nearly three million people took to the streets, and they were not able to do that. And I think what people don't um, sometimes understand, people who have not been to Tehran, is that Tehran is an enormous city. Uh, it's much more akin to uh, Los Angeles than it is Manhattan, in the sense that it's the vast city spread out. And it's very easy for the government to uh, prevent people from congregating in one area. You can just simply block off highways and thoroughfares and prevent people from getting to where they need to go. And I think this is a, a strategy which the opposition eventually has to go beyond. They've already shown themselves to have uh, a lot of numbers. I have no doubt that if people were allowed to freely assemble, you would see crowds upward of, of five million in the city of Tehran, and I think millions more elsewhere. But I think. Um, at some point, they have to go beyond the strategy of merely bringing people to the streets. Uh, that's much easier said than done, especially when you have this leadership of the opposition movement under such tremendous duress. Uh, a friend of mine who goes back many years with uh, uh, Musavi and Khatami was uh, explaining for me the circumstances under, uh, uh, the, under um, which they're operating right now. And he was explaining that when they communicate with one another, they're all basically under house arrest. And he said when they communicate with one another, they turn up the volume of the radio full blast, and then they have to whisper in one another's ear. Or if they're communicating sensitive messages, oftentimes they can't even trust uh, 
the people who have been appointed to be their bodyguards. Um, so they will write the message on a sheet of paper um, uh, and show it to the person that they want to send the message to. And then they tear up and burn that sheet of paper. So under these circumstances, it's very, very difficult. Um, uh, it's a tall order for them to be able to uh, lead some type of a movement which brings down a government which has enormous resources at its disposal. Now, I think that another important uh, distinction to make between uh, today's opposition uh, and today's regime and that of three decades prior uh, is the fact that when you look at um, the um, revolutionary elite, the, the elite uh, uh, um, whether in the clergy or the revolutionary guards, people surrounding Ayatollah Khamenei, um, the vast majority of them spent uh, their formative years uh, either in the seminaries of Qom and Najaf, or in the case of the Revolutionary Guards in the battlefront of Iraq. And you compare them to the Shah's elite three decades ago, who many of them spent their formative years studying in the United States and Europe. And certainly they were patriots, but when the going got tough and the Shah's regime was beginning to crumble, they could make their lives outside of Iran. Uh, as opposed to this current crop, it's long been said about them that they're not going to leave Iran without a much bloodier fight. You know, there's no future for Ayatollah Khamenei in, in, in Westwood or in the south of France <laughs> in Bethesda. Um, so it's long been said about them that they're not going to leave Iran without a bloody fight. And I think there was another important lesson which Khamenei in particular learned uh, from the Shah's experience. And it was a very famous incident in late 1978, uh, in which the Shah, when his government was crumbling before his eyes, he went on national television and he apologized to people. He apologized for past sins and past transgressions. And he very, very famously said, I've heard the voice of your revolution. And I once found a quote from Khamenei in which he said that, you know, the Shah thought by apologizing to us and saying to us that he'd heard the voice of our revolution, he thought that was going to appease us, that was going to pacify us, and that was going to quell the crowds. He didn't realize that's when we saw exactly how vulnerable he was, how weak he was. We smelled blood and we pounced. And you've noticed that over the course of the last eight months, uh, the leadership of the Islamic Republic, particularly Khamenei, has not been willing to see one inch since the election results. Because the perception is that if you, if you compromise, it's not going to um, allay uh, uh, the, the pressure against you. It's going to project weakness and invite even more pressure. And so he's essentially put himself in this trap whereby he can't uh, compromise because he believes that's going to increase the pressure against him. But at the same time, by not making any conciliatory gestures towards the opposition, by refusing to compromise at all, the opposition is not going away. Uh, so I think this is a trap which is going to be difficult for Khamenei to find himself a way out of. So um, obviously I think anyone who has worked on Iran knows better than to make predictions about the future. I'm hopeful about uh, the long term future, but I think in the short term um, it could get uglier before it gets prettier. Um, but I, I tell people that if I, if I was an investor and the Islamic Republic of Iran were a stock, I certainly wouldn't buy shares in it. I would probably short this stock. Uh, so um, um, I, 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 I think over the long term, the fate of the Islamic Republic for me will very much resemble the fate of the Soviet Union. Uh, but how and when that happens, obviously, is very unclear. And let me segue now to, to the United States and US policy and some of the challenges uh, facing the Obama administration, particularly with regards to uh, Iran. When uh, President Obama won last um, November 2008, um, it was part of a, a small group of people who were thinking about um, um, how the United States should reorient itself and reorient its policy towards the world in the aftermath of the Bush administration. And for me, I, I, I look around the world and I say, okay, there's, uh, when I think about uh, 
foreign policy challenges facing the United States, there's half a dozen things that immediately come to mind. Obviously one, especially for this administration, is Afghanistan. Another is Iraq. Another is the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, another is the issue of terrorism, uh, energy security, and certainly, uh, last but not least, nuclear proliferation. I think when you look at these issues individually, what binds them is the fact that Iran is integral to every single one of them. Meaning Iran has enormous uh, borders and influence um, with, inside um, Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think everyone recognizes that it's going to be very difficult to stabilize those two countries absent a more cooperative role from Iran. Uh, likewise, given Iran's uh, relations and excuse me, support for groups like Hamas and Hezbollah, it's going to be very difficult to reach some type of a settlement of uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict absent a more cooperative role from Iran. Um, and given the fact that Iran has the world's second largest reserves of oil and natural gas, um, the issue of energy security is not going to be ameliorated uh, absent a more cooperative role from Iran. And last, uh, uh, but, but perhaps most importantly for the United States, the issue of nuclear proliferation and the concerns about Iran's nuclear ambitions. So I think when the Obama administration uh, looked around at these issues and Iran's uh, important role in all of them, they quickly calculated that shunning Iran, not having any dialogue with Iran is not an option. Uh, that was by and large the approach taken during the Bush administration None of these issues were ameliorated. Not to mention that the domestic situation in Iran got worse. It didn't get better by shunning Iran. Um, secondly, I think they very quickly assessed that military action against Iran would exacerbate every single one of those issues. Uh, again, not to mention the potentially disastrous um, consequences it could have in Iran internally. And they uh, quickly realized uh, that uh, dialogue with Iran, engagement with, with Iran, was really the only way forward. And I, I don't think that they were um, um, terribly optimistic about the prospect of reaching some type of a, a rapprochement uh, with Iran. Um, but their assessment was that uh, the United States needed to probe a couple seemingly facile but fundamental questions vis-a-vis um, -vis Iran. And I think the, the, the first is simply, why does Iran behave the way it does? What drives Iranian policies? Are Iranian policies a reaction to the hostile policies of the United States? Uh, this, I think, became conventional wisdom in many quarters during the Bush administration, that um, the rhetoric like the axis of evil and uh, the military threats against Iran were simply um, um, provoking Iran to react uh, provocatively itself, and uh, a change in U.S. Uh, and, and, and Washington's orientation towards Tehran uh, could beget goodwill, as George Bush Sr. said, goodwill could get, be, beget goodwill. Um, so, so, so again, was Iran simply reacting to hostile U.S. policies, or is Iranian behavior or Iranian policies uh, um, driven by this immutable revolutionary ideology? which was born of the 1979 revolution, and it's really incapable of changing. And I would argue that this particular administration, the Obama administration, has made more effort to reach out to Iran and try to change the tone and context of the U.S.-Iran relationship than any U.S. administration since the 1979 revolution. It started actually on Inauguration Day, uh, when President Obama said, the United States will out extend its hand if Iran unclenches its fists. Then there was the no lose greeting, I'm sure you all remember, uh, March of 2009, in which he referred to Iran as, quote unquote, the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, which is maybe something um, many people miss, but it was the very first time that a US president had referred to Iran as the Islamic Republic of Iran, basically uh, with an implicit acknowledgement of the character of the Iranian government. Um, and most importantly, what did make headlines was that uh, the president wrote two private letters to Ayatollah Khamenei, uh, the Supreme Leader, uh, 
making it very clear that the United States genuinely wanted to turn the page with Iran after three decades of hostility.